Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello and welcome to SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Justin Drower, on behalf of the Faculty Division of the Federalist Society. We're here today to discuss the decision in New York v. New Jersey, which was handed down on April 18th. It's my honor to introduce our guest today, Professor Daniel Barnheiser. He is a professor of law and the Bradford Stone Faculty Scholar at Michigan State University College of Law. He teaches and writes in the areas of contract law and theory, conservation law, comparative law, and the jurisprudence associated with the rule of law. And he is the co-author of case books in the fields of contracts and commercial transactions. And we're very happy to have him on SCOTUScast today uh, to talk about New York v. New Jersey. So thank you for joining us on, on somewhat short notice, too. Well, Justin, thank you for having me. This is actually kind of uh, a an exciting case in some ways. You know, contract scholars don't usually get to comment much on uh, the Supreme Court Supreme Court jurisprudence, but this uh, this case is actually pretty exciting from a contract perspective. And in terms of the background of the case, this case arises from a dispute between New York and New Jersey regarding whether New Jersey could unilaterally withdraw from an interstate compact entered under the compact clause of the U.S. Constitution, so Article 1, Section 10. The Waterfront Commission Compact, it was created, executed in 1953, and you know, the, 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 uh, the classic movie on the waterfront was kind of, it, it, it illustrates the, the depth of organized crime activity and corruption that that existed in the port of New York and New Jersey. So after several years of investigation, uh, New York and New Jersey came together and they created the compact that itself created the Waterfront Commission of New York Harbor. And in that commission, both states delegated sovereign authority to the commission to conduct regulatory and law enforcement activities at the port. And those activities could cross state lines without having to involve additional legal proceedings from either state individually. And then beginning in the early 2000s, New Jersey starts getting more unhappy with the commission. It's in one one respect, it's an issue of mission creep. Uh, The commission... Uh, was engaging in regulatory actions that, according to New Jersey, were creating labor shortages and labor problems, uh, were non-responsive to the technological changes that are happening in shipping and at the ports. And so, as the court opinion notes, New Jersey came to view the commission as ill-equipped to handle 21st century security challenges and was a source of overregulation that impedes job growth. Now, At the same time, I mentioned technological changes. Uh, That's critical for understanding the the, the sort of the incentives behind New Jersey trying to get out of this compact. When the commission is created in 1953, cargo handling uh, was, uh, you know, it was was bulk break cargo, uh, which means the cargo was loaded individually within cargo ships and unloading required extraordinary time and labor. Um, But in 1956, we have the advent of the very first standardized shipping container, uh, and it's only three years after the the commission is created. It takes 20 to 30 years for cargo container shipping to be the number one absolute dominant force in shipping. And what that does is it moves... The New York side of the harbor is much better suited for heavy heavy labor uh, uh, and the individualized cargo capacity for bulk break cargo. The New Jersey side is way better suited for uh, for standardized ship, shipping containers. And so by 2018, 80% of the cargo and work is happening on the New Jersey side of the port. And in response to all this, New Jersey passed a statute that permits New Jersey to withdraw from the Waterfront Commission Compact on 90 days notice. And of course, the Waterfront Commission immediately sues New Jersey. 
uh, to, to enjoin that withdrawal. And it won at the trial court level. The Third Circuit ultimately reversed, holding the suit is barred by uh, New Jersey's state sovereign immunity. And very almost immediately after that Third Circuit decision, New Jersey announces its intent to withdraw from the compact, and New York sought the Supreme Court review to enjoin that withdrawal. All right. Thank you for the quick summary of that. Um, so kind of moving post-decision, uh, is there anything interesting behind the unanimous vote or or any uh, elements of the, the decision, I guess, that uh, would be interesting to touch on? Yeah, the, the I guess the 9-0 vote is kind of cool because we don't see those very often anymore. Um, and it may just be that uh, realistically, it, I think my in terms of mindset, the moment this was moved into a contract perspective rather than uh, sort of a uh, more focusing on uh, other constitutional other constitutional doctrines, uh, I think this the ideological stakes may be much lower. Um, you know it's the the United States was, uh, I believe, an amicus on the New Jersey side of the argument. Um, there was there's there's really it, there's not a lot of of reason to keep the parties in this compact. Um, it's you know it's basically at New York is just trying to continue the uh, the I don't want to say gravy train, but they're trying to continue the I just did say gravy train, but they're trying to continue this this temporary government program. Uh, you know, and it was intended to be temporary. And I went through some of the legislative history, and they and Governor Dewey of New York actually is, has a stage. You know, he's hoping that this will uh, we will be able to eventually end the commission uh, when it solves the organized pr crime problem. So it's I don't think the stakes for constitutional jurisprudence are especially huge. And I, once you get the ideology out of it, then it looks like the, the uh, justices can actually agree on basic contract principles. In terms of the reasoning, for, from a contract scholar perspective, the reasoning is awesome because all we usually get is, you know, the Supreme Court trying to figure out the Federal Arbitration Act. And um, I mean, there's a few, a few other situations where we do see the, the SCOTUS uh, popping into contract, but generally it's rare that we actually see the Supreme Court doing what you would expect a regular trial court or appellate, appellate state court to be doing with respect to interpreting the contract. So it, it's kind of cool in, in that uh, you know, all of a sudden we're getting uh, a uh, an opinion on contract interpretation that we don't, we're from a source we don't usually see it. Um, the the contract analysis is pretty straightforward, though. It's uh, you know, the Justice Kavanaugh writing for the unanimous court uh, began with the observation that to with, resolve the dispute over whether each state may unilaterally withdraw, we begin by examining the express terms of the compact as the best indication of the intent of the parties. Uh, and, and the contract law analysis is it, it goes step by step exactly like you're supposed to. They start with the text of the compact and the text of, of the compact is silent on the issue of unilateral withdrawal. Uh, so in contrast, there are other interstate compacts that do expressly prohibit unilateral withdrawal. And there are others that expressly uh, specify other termination events. And so the a good example of that is the pending interstate compact uh, to uh, award the national the uh, the uh, elect votes of the electoral college of each state to the winner of the nat national popular vote, regardless of how that per that candidate did within that state, and that compact specifies. Uh, termination provisions in it, such as the uh, the compact terminates if the members of the compact drop below the uh, necessary number of uh, electoral votes to elect a president. Um, and so, in this in this instance, the court looked at that silence and held that it really doesn't it doesn't tell us anything. The, you can't argue from from silence that the parties did or did not uh, uh, intend to uh, uh, limit the right of a party to un unilaterally withdraw. 
So then the court moves to the next step. If the text of the contract itself uh, doesn't answer your problem, you go to background principles of contract law. And under the principles uh, that existed at the time of the compact and today, uh, the court said a contract like this compact that contemplates continuing performance for an indefinite time is to be interpreted as stipulating only for performance terminable at the will of either party. And this is a great, I, I really appreciate the, the reasoning here and the distinction here between other types of compacts that allocate property rights or, or things like property rights. It, it, the court is basically looking at this as analogous to an at-will employment situation. At-will employment is the default rule in employment contracts. Uh, if the parties don't specify a term, then all then an employment contract just says that the employer will employ and pay and the employee will, will work for an indefinite term. And either party may terminate that contract uh, at, at will. Um, and this is distinguished from the uh, types of co interstate compacts that allocate property or similar rights. Uh, so things, uh, compacts that set state boundaries. That's more like, and the court didn't do this analysis, but it, it, you can see it implied, it's more like a sale of goods. Uh, you, you know, in a sale of goods, at the end of the sale, the seller walks away with money uh, or the price for the goods, and the buyer walks away with the goods. And we don't want either of those parties to be able to say, yeah, I'm, I'm unilaterally withdrawing from this contract. Give me my stuff back or give me my money back. It's, it's you know, the instead, the party's legal relationship is set at that point, And that allocation of rights that's set allows other people to rely on the allocation of rights, allows other people to do their own legal relationships around that allocation of rights. So I th that's that's kind of the really, really cool, interesting uh, part of the reasoning that uh, in this in this opinion. So then in, in terms of implications of this decision going forward, it's probably, if I understand you correctly, it's probably kind of a case specific decision and you know, not really ideologically uh, impactful going forward. Yeah, it's I mean, New York, New York's briefs put forward this parade of horribles, but they you, when you read through them, it's actually not all that horrible. It uh, the New York for my favorite one, New York argues that permitting New Jersey to unilaterally withdraw would have sweeping consequences for interstate compacts generally. Um, you know, yes, it will, I think, have sweeping consequences, but not for the reasons New York was likely concerned about. I think New York was concerned about, well, there may be other interstate compacts out there that don't have, don't specifically state whether a party may unilaterally withdraw. Um, the, the court decision here uh, makes clear that you know, the ones that allocate property rights or similar rights, those are off the table. Uh, the, you, there's no unilateral withdrawal once the transfer has been accomplished. But uh, for others, I think that the, you know, the for the performance for an indefinite term in in contracts, we actually like parties being able to break their contract. Uh, it's uh, or the related concept of efficient breach. In in this situation, the I, looking at the background of this case the Waterfront Commission no longer made economic sense. It was no longer efficient because the problem it was created to solve had, had largely been solved. There were huge problems within the commission. The an investigatory report back in 2009 uh, detailed a culture of abuse within the commission. And New Jersey was, was claiming that the commission was in order to continue justifying its existence, it was over-regulating activities at the port, which suppressed the ability of New Jersey to bring in the labor and the technology that it needs to sort of maintain a 21st century uh, port specializing in containerized shipping. Um, and so we, we want New Jersey to be able to, be able to say, circumstances have changed. Let's not have this... this I, Milton Friedman in uh, Tyranny of the Status Quo uh, wrote uh, that nothing is so permanent as a temporary government program. Um, and uh, 
you know, that's absolutely true here. There were the temporary government program to justify its continued existence. Uh, it, it needed to do stuff. And what can you do? Well, you regulate stuff and, and, uh, uh, and you make yourself es essential. And New Jersey at this point uh, had an interest in revamping that, that 1950s structure to try and deal with 21st century problems. Um, the other interesting implication I think we're going to have here is, and the, I don't think the, the Supreme Court focused on this, the trial court did, did somewhat when the Waterfront Commission sued uh, New Jersey to enjoin the statute, uh, permitting New Jersey to withdraw. Um, but the trial court actually noted that with the, with the commission, the commission is a joint enterprise between New York and New Jersey. And both states were contributing, contributing property, assets, resources to that commission, to the commission's work. Um, and what the Supreme Court opinion doesn't resolve from a property perspective is how, do, how does New York get its stuff back that happens to be on the New Jersey side? Or we, if New York made investments in, in upgrading New Jersey facilities, or if New Jersey made investments upgrading New York facilities, is it just whatever's on one side of the river uh, goes to New Jersey, the other, go, other side goes to New York, and each party eats its losses? That, that's kind of left out, out in the open. The trial court thought that was, that was very important um, for unwinding this, this deal. But um, other than that, uh, it, from an ideological perspective, it's just a good, solid, uh, and, and highly welcome uh, uh, unanimous opinion from the, from the Supreme Court. All right, so Professor Barnheiser, thank you for joining us today and, and talking about the case. Thank you for having me. This was, this was fantastic. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 